We are covering a tough topic today, and that is neoplasia. Neoplasia just means new growth. Other terms that you might hear that are included under neoplasia include tumor, growth, nodule, mass, or cancer. Cancer does imply the bad kinds or malignancy. The way that a, a cancer or neoplasia behaves is called either benign or malignant. A benign type, benign type of neoplasia is one that thankfully is not as big of a deal. Sure, it may be ugly, it may be in an irritating location, so like under an arm where you feel it all the time, or in your mouth, so you it's bothering you, but it's not going to likely kill you. Malignant neoplasia is the bad scary kinds, the kinds that can go to your liver, the kind that can go to your lungs, the kind that can go pretty much wherever it wants to in the body, depending on the type. Now, the way to diagnose neoplasia is cytology. Cytology is this amazing science of looking at cells under a microscope. So the way to get those cells is either an aspirate or a biopsy, so basically a tiny little needle or a larger chunk. When possible, that larger chunk could maybe be the entire neoplasia, neoplasm, and if you catch it early enough, sometimes even the really bad scary kinds of cancer can be removed and your pet could be cured. So the sooner you diagnose, the better, always. Big, big fact. Now, the normal, any, any normal cell in the body can become neoplastic if two criteria are met. The first is that the cell develops mutations that allow it to no longer obey the boundaries of adjacent cells. So basically, it is now free to have uncontrolled growth. The second criteria is that it is able to produce its own blood supply. So continue to grow, continue to be alive. And parts of a neoplasm may have some dead areas where the blood supply um, wasn't enough because of how fast they're growing. They can literally outgrow their ability to live. Crazy thing. Now, the way that I've described this happening, a neoplasm can form due to trauma and any stimulus for repeated or, or improved um, cellular growth. So think about you um, have just a little tick and unfortunately you kind of just scratch your arm in one spot over and over and over all the time. You just don't even think about it, you just do it. It causes that area for the skin in that area to grow rapidly and replenish. And so you will be at a little bit of an increased risk of moles or other um, changes in your skin to develop in that spot. Another example that you might be able to relate to more are conditions of chronic inflammation, like inflammatory bowel disease. Those are cases that with rapid cell turnover, if cells are um, angry and happy and continuing to act and work harder, if there's more cells turning out, there's always that increased risk. The more growth, the more potential for an error. And that's how a neoplasm occurs. So the um, types of cancer as I said, can vary. And that also is important for determining, can you really cure the cancer? Treatment options are three, surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy. Surgery is selected if it is a localized neoplasm that hopefully can be removed or at least debulked. Debulked means you can remove the majority of it or at least a chunk of it, but not the whole thing. There are leftover cells that you can see. There's an area that you know is still infected or affected with this neoplasm. After doing surgery, if there are remnant cells or if you just cannot do surgery because of location, radiation may be chosen. Radiation allows for you to treat and hopefully destroy the cells that are unhealthy in one spot. The third option is for when those options fail or it's not local, it is diffuse. It is throughout the body. Chemotherapy in humans brings up some really awful images in most people's minds. We pretty much all know someone closely who has gone through chemotherapy. We know chemotherapy is tough. Sometimes in humans, 
like in cats and dogs, you will cure that cancer with chemotherapy. But in cats and dogs, it is much less common to cure cancer with chemotherapy than in humans. This is partly due to just how our cancers are compared to them biologically, but it is also how we use chemotherapy. So remember I said we all have that really awful image in our minds of someone we love going through it. We don't want that for animals. There is an ethics concern that you cannot explain to and you cannot have a pet make the choice. They, they don't get a choice. So you can't tell them, hey, you're gonna feel really, really bad for X amount of time, but it's with the goal of seeing can we cure this. If we are going to be giving a treatment that makes them feel worse than the cancer did, that's just not something we ethically can do in animals. Inflicting pain for a while without a high hope of an improvement is not kind. So what we do is we use the chemotherapy to help improve quality and duration of the rest of their life. Can we get them more time? Can we get them more pets, more food, more outings, more time with their loved ones? That is our goal. So when you are faced with this terrible kind of news about your pet, you're gonna be overwhelmed. You're not gonna say, oh, it's fine, I watched a video about this. It sucks. There is no way to sugarcoat it. There's no way to snap a mandate on it and ignore it. It's bad, bad news if it is malignant and if you catch it late. The common thing to see in animals is one day your dog is lethargic and you say, huh, by the end of the day he's not getting up. Something horrible happens really quickly or a change happens suddenly that you haven't seen any indication something was going on. And we unfortunately at the ER quickly diagnose something terrible. That's a lot to process. There's no way to make that easier. But the thing to realize is even with normal blood work even with seemingly no clinical signs until it's a crisis due to location, due to what's invading, due to how it's acting on the rest of your body, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. I've had dogs come in with growths in their belly that weigh as much as all of their limbs, just really, really large, but they were able to, to conceal it because it's just growing throughout the abdomen. It's not that obvious. And then one day they come in because that ruptured and they're now bleeding into their belly. So people frequently tell me they saw no clinical signs. And you're right, your dog probably didn't even know that he had that growth. Maybe he felt a little bloated, but it probably wasn't painful. It probably was not something that clearly was causing him to vomit, feel poorly, not wanna be as active or eat as well. It's not your fault. And I will say that again because I think it's hard to believe and we just want an answer. We want to know why, why did this happen to my pet? What did I do wrong? How do I prevent this for my next pet? Honestly, the answer is almost absolutely always, you did nothing wrong. This is an accident. This is cellular replication that went haywire. And while it is never, never something that you can stop asking yourself, could I have done something different? I wanna stress that there's nothing you did wrong. You caught it as soon as you caught it. And now the goal, even if it's just for a moment, is love. Love your pet like the way they love you. Love them like the expression they show on their face when you walk in the door and they're just so excited. Or if it's your kitty, maybe it's the sassy little side glance they give you that you just know, okay, you did miss me, even though you peed on the bed. So again, there's no way to lighten this kind of topic, but we're here for you. Contact a specialist if you need to. They're called oncologists. It's just a study of oncology. Um, and reach out to your veterinarian with questions. Take that moment, take whatever time you need to process within reason, but then talk to the specialist, talk to people to find out the best path for you and your pet.